I mean, I ate so much stuff. The 4th of July, I'm still suffering from it. But that's my fault. That's not the Lord's fault. But it's a time, it's more of a relaxed schedule usually. And it's a good time to renew our lives spiritually and replenish our lives. I think about David when he prayed that prayer in uh, Psalm 51 and said, Restore, Lord, the joy of my salvation. And that's a great prayer to pray. That whole chapter is. But to restore the joy, replenish the joy in my life. You know, sin will take the joy away every time. If we sin or practice sin, we will definitely not be filled with God's joy. But we can repent and come back and experience the joy of the Lord. Restore the joy. Since one of the major themes in Luke chapter 15 is joy, it's all through the chapter. C.S. Lewis wrote these words about this chapter, about the Bible. It says, joy is the serious business of heaven. And it is a joy in which you and I can share. And this is what we're talking about today. It's not just a, an emotion when everything is going well, but it is that joy from heaven, heaven's joy in our soul today. We need that. We need that in our lives. We can share the joy of heaven by following the pattern of this chapter and the first thing is reach out to the lost and then be, be involved in finding those who are lost, getting them saved and rejoicing with heaven over their salvation. My, if you had my notes, which most of you don't this morning, am I too loud out there? I was too loud the other week. They said I was shouting at them. I said, well, I can't tell up here. Anyway, my first point is lost, lost, lost. Because there are three ways in this chapter a person can be lost. And the first one is uh, wandering away. Sheep wander. They wander along. Sometimes they are so busy feeding themselves that they lose track of where they are in relationship to the flock and the shepherd. And when they come to their senses, the crowd, the flock is nowhere to be found. And they're lost. Sheep cannot find direction. They are poor when it comes to finding their way back. Every once in a while, I read about a dog that has been lost and maybe hundreds of miles away, but finds its way back to its master. It's amazing, isn't it? I've seen some that have come hundreds of miles. I've read some. Uh, and you see this pretty often. A wreck took place. The dog was in the car. The man was, was seriously injured. The dog ran, and they couldn't find it. And then it found its way back home. Sheep are not that way. That's why they have to have a shepherd. Sheep are clueless when it comes to direction. And if the lead sheep goes over the cliff, everyone that follows it will go over the cliff with it. That's how sheep are. They follow. And there are lead sheep in the flock. And they will follow that sheep even if it goes over the cliff. I think about the song. I love it. I, I can't remember the, the, the title of it, but it, it says, Prone to Wonder. Wonder, Lord, I need thee. Prone to leave the God I love. And Christians never drift closer to God. They drift away from God. The current of this world will take us away from God and we'll find ourselves wondering, where is God? Well, God hasn't gone any place. If anybody goofed up, it's us, amen? Because God is perfect. But we can wonder. 
and left to ourselves without the proper spiritual nourishment and the disciplines of the faith, we will wander away from God. It's just the way it is. There's a, our nature is bent towards sin. And if it takes control of our life, we will, we will get away from God. Ten, sheep have that tendency to go astray. That's why they need a shepherd. In Isaiah 53, 6, the Bible says, All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. And so we've all wondered. The problem in this passage, and as you read in that first verse about the Pharisees complaining because he's eating, is because they didn't see themselves in need of a shepherd, and they didn't believe they were wandering, and they didn't believe they had wandered away from God. Religion will not bring you to God, but God's Word and Holy Spirit will. Peter said this in 1 Peter 2.25, Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you've turned to the, your shepherd, the guardian of, guardian of your souls. Aren't you glad that we have a shepherd this morning? It's not the pastor. It's a lot higher than that. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The shepherd represents Jesus in this passage. He represents Jesus, the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd of the sheep, as the Bible calls him, had sheep that strayed away. Sometimes when people leave us, they will look at me like, what did you do? Well... If they left Jesus, they will leave us, amen? And they don't always go in the right direction. And many times they do. They tell me that God has led me. Well, I can't argue with God, but I'll be honest with you. Most of the time, I don't believe it because God isn't confused. Grow where you're planted. Bring fruit where you are and quit looking over the fence at the greener grass. That's where the septic tank is. You don't want to go over there. If you go to another church, you take every problem you've got with you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm so glad I could say that. I feel a whole lot better this morning. The scribes and Pharisees had no problem seeing publicans and sinners as lost sheep, but they would not apply that image to themselves. And that's why they were offended. And yet the prophet made it clear, all of us have sinned and gone astray. Who is all of us? Every single one of us. And that includes religious people. And this explains why he would leave the flock with the other shepherds and go and search for the missing animal and then rejoice when he had found it. You see, not to find the lost sheep meant money out of his own pocket, plus the disgrace of being a careless shepherd who didn't watch over his sheep carefully. But our God neither slumbers nor sleeps. And there's no place you and I can go that God isn't watching over us. Amen. And so we have that shepherd. And so by leaving the 99 sheep, the shepherd was not saying the others were unimportant. They were safe, but the lost sheep was in danger. And the fact that the shepherd would go after one sheep is proof that each animal was dear to him. Did you know the shepherd knew every sheep in his flock by name 
and could call them by name. You see, people don't get saved in mass. It's individual people that are important to God. God cares about you this morning. He cares about me. Now, the devil would tell you he doesn't. Where is God? That's what he said. Why did, did God say this? He knows if you eat that fruit, you'll be wise like he is. In other words, he questioned God. And that question was inserted into Eve's heart as well. But I'm here to tell you, God cares about every single person in this room. Not a single sparrow falls to the ground that God isn't aware of. He knows how many hairs are on your head. That's getting easier and easier for some of us. Our hair is getting a little thin, but God knows how many is up there. I keep, I'm glad. I pray they don't let go. Just hold on. You know what I mean? And uh, and I want to, I'd like to keep my hair, but I'm losing it. But carelessness. That, that, that shepherd is not careless. Jesus is not suggesting that scribes and Pharisees were not in need of salvation, for they certainly were. They needed the Lord. They had religion, but they didn't have the relationship with God. So number one, wandering away. Number two, carelessness. And that is the, the woman who lost the, the uh, coin. The sheep was lost because of its foolishness. The coin was lost because of its, the carelessness of another. It's a sobering thought that our carelessness at home could result in a soul being lost. That sobers me. That actually the way I conduct myself. You know, I often thank God. For my father, whom I never in my entire life ever knew to be spasmodic in going to church. And when he was on his deathbed, I said, Dad, I'm saved today because of you. I I wasn't in church. Church was put in me. And I want to thank you for that. And I'm going to do that for my kids as well. Now, does that guarantee kids will be saved? Absolutely not. But it's better for you and I to set the right example. I'm going to quote one of my favorite theological expressions. What you do in moderation, they will do in excess. They're taking it another step further. And I believe this generation is on the cusp of stepping over the line. It's time for us to draw back and seek after God and seek to get closer to God than we have ever been before. Methods, methods, methods. You can read them. I get hundreds of emails a week on how to do it, how to build a church. But isn't it, wouldn't it be something if sinners came because they felt we cared about them? We love them, actually. And we would love to be a help to them and a blessing to them. Now, isn't that a novel thought? But that's exactly what we need. Careless handling or carelessness on the part. You see, when a Jewish girl got married, she began to wear a headband of 10 silver coins to signify that she was now a wife. It's, it's equivalent to a wedding ring. That's her own finger. <laughs> that one. That should be in our nose, shouldn't it? But we got it on the finger. Anyway, it means that I'm taken and I'm not available. Praise the Lord. And so the, the, that's what it was. Her wedding, like re- losing your wedding ring. It was a Jewish version of our modern wedding ring. And it would be considered a calamity 
for her to lose one of those coins. The homes were, were dark in those days. They didn't have electricity. And so she had to light a lamp and searched until she found the lost coin. And we can imagine her joy in finding it. And then, I didn't read it this morning, but the prodigal son willfully walked away. He was rebellious. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. I want to say it again. Rebellion is of the devil. It is as the sin of witchcraft. Whether it's in an adult who is rebelling or in a child who is rebelling, it is wrong. But this man was rebellious and willfully walked away. And that's why I said you could do all the right things and your children can choose to not serve the Lord. And the devil will try to beat you up and tell you if you're a better parent you would do better. Well, I'll tell you, I believe that I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that when I talk to my children, it's not just my words. It's what God has given me to say. And those words take on a new meaning and a new power. And I can speak into and make a difference in their life because I'm full of the Holy Spirit. And I think about, I've seen folks who have never made the effort to be filled with the Spirit and the devil eat their lunch every day. Their children are lost. And I'm thinking, you need to get a baptism in the Spirit. They need to see you on fire for God and you speaking God's Word that you live every day into their lives. And oftentimes, when a parent has missed it, they call us when it's too late. And they, they want us to help rescue. And that's a tough one because nobody has the influence that you have to your family. Absolutely nobody. And it isn't suppo it's supposed to be that way. God wants us to know he's given us some tools. Let's take those and work with them. The prodigal was willful in departing from the faith. These parables help us understand what it means to be lost. To begin with, it means being out of place. Sheep belong with a flock. Coins belong on the chain. Lost sinners belong in fellowship with God. But to be lost also means out of service. A lost sheep is of no value to the shepherd. A lost coin has no value to the owner. A lost sinner cannot experience the enriching fulfillment God has for him in Christ. But to turn this around, to be found, which is the equivalent to being saved, means that you're back in place, reconciled to God. Back in service, life has a purpose. And out of danger... And you're a valuable to God. You're a value to the a person that you're with. No wonder the shepherd and the woman and the father rejoiced and invited their friends <clears throat> to rejoice with them. And my second point is this. Found, found, found. A shepherd goes out in the night to find a lost sheep. A woman searched diligently until she found the coin. The father waited patiently, never giving up hope, waiting for that prodigal to come home. It's easy for us today to read these parables and take the message for granted. But the people who first heard them must have been shocked when they heard what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, God actually searches for lost sinners. Hear me this morning. God actually searches for lost souls. He is searching. Where is he this morning? He's searching for the lost. Just like when he was on earth. 
Jesus was saying that God actually searches for lost sinners. No wonder the scribes and Pharisees were offended, for there was no place in their legalistic theology for a God like that. They were hard. They were ready to criticize, ready to throw rocks, ready to condemn. But here's Jesus reaching out in passion and compassion to touch the lost. We must not lose that. We must keep that. They had forgotten that God had sought out Adam and Eve. You can read it in Genesis 3, 8, and 9. Adam Adam, where are you, Adam? He was hiding from God. God is a searching God. And when we are away from him and we're drifting away, God is seeking after us. He's trying to turn us around. This is the picture that Jesus painted. Despite their supposed knowledge of the scriptures, the scribes and the Pharisees forgot God was like a father who pitied pitied his wayward children. As a father hath pity on his children, so the Lord has pity on us. Aren't you glad? My God is a compassionate God. He doesn't shoot the wounded. He seeks to restore them. God is good. Finding the lost involves two factors. Never forget it. First is the divine factor. God seeks those who are away from the ark of safety, those who are in danger. And unless God... If God cannot turn them around, guess what? You can't. But we also have a part to play. He uses people like you and me in the process of bringing them to repentance and restoration. I can't make a person repent. That comes from God. I can only do what God leads me to do. I cannot save a soul. I cannot cause a person. If you're my convert, you're not going to last very long. But if Jesus has dealt with your heart, and he's used somebody else to help you along the way, that's the way it is. We're workers together with God. Jesus said, the harvest is great. The laborers are few. He's looking for those who will team up with him. He does the real work. And when those people get saved, look what I did. I led this one to the Lord. No, no, you didn't. He led them. You were just his instrument. And that's important. I can't can't stress it enough. It's important, but it's not, it's not even half the story. The bigger part of the story is God. God has been working behind the scenes. You see, when I come to Christ and put my faith in Jesus, was born again, I had already had this sense in my heart, something is drastically missing in my life. I thought when I got away from home and I could make my own decisions and I didn't have someone else thinking for me and telling me what I would do and what I wouldn't do, I thought, man, that's going to be living. But I found out something is wrong with my life. Something is missing. You see, God's Holy Spirit was already working And when the pastor gave the altar call in that Sunday night service, and I found myself at the altar repenting of my sins and really born again, it was a combination of two things. God's work in my heart and his servant doing the work that he was called to do. 
We throw the net out. But God puts the fish in it. Amen? We draw it in and try to nurture them and help them. That's our role. But it's still God working through us and with us. And so we need to to realize that. Finding the loss involves both of those factors. You eliminate either, and the process breaks down. When D.L. Moody was directing the Sunday school in Chicago, one boy walked several miles to attend, and somebody asked him, why don't you go to a Sunday school closer to home? His reply might have been used by the publicans and sinners in Jesus' day because they love a fellow over there. They, the publicans and sinners recognized Jesus cared. Jesus cared. And this man felt his Sunday school teacher cared about him. I cannot imagine teaching the class, walking out of that class, and never returning again because of what it says to those students. I can't imagine doing that. God is calling us. Let's grow up, folks. Let's put on our big boy shoes and britches. Let's stand up and be men and women of God. And come hell or high water, let's decide we're not being moved because God has planted us on a rock and we know whom we have believed and we're persuaded that he's able to keep us. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. It's significant. Jesus attracted sinners while the Pharisees repelled them. What does that say about some of our churches today? Lost sinners came to Jesus, not because he catered to them or compromised his message, but because he cared for them. I'm not saying methods shouldn't change. Methods are not sacred. But I'm saying just methods alone is a bunch of malarkey. There has to be a heart of compassion and love. They have to see Christ's love in us as we deal with people who may be dirty, who may have come out of the depths of sin. But listen, I found out early in my, in my ministry There's no man so low Christ is not able to reach down and pick them up. And none so high that he isn't able to reach up and bring them to the place they need to be. He's able today. He's able. Jesus cared. He understood their needs and he tried to help them while the Pharisees criticized them and kept their distance. The Pharisees had a knowledge of the Old Testament law. They had a desire for personal purity. They had no love for lost souls. We must not have that. Third point, joy, joy, joy. There's a fourfold joy expressed when a lost person comes to the Savior. They find faith in Christ. Though nothing is said in the story about how the sheep felt, there is certainly joy in the heart of the person found. Can you remember when you were born again? What you felt? Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm I'm a new creature. I felt so released. The burden is gone. The the hatred is gone. The rebellion is gone. I know Jesus, and I had never known him before. Joy. Our own experience teaches us that. But there's also the joy of the person who does 
the finding, the person who is instrumental. I'll never forget when I was dealing with what I thought was the meanest man I'd ever met. He was, he was, he was a devil on wheels. I was afraid of him, to be honest with you. And in my little postage stamp size office that I had in the church where I was pastoring, I told my secretary, if you hear any rumbles in my office, call the police, please. Because <laughs> this man, they didn't send one cop to arrest him. They sent a squad. And he was known as a cop hater. And I'll never forget him pouring out his heart to me. Six months before, I just preached his eight-year-old daughter's funeral. Who died from appendicitis because he was drunk and would not take her to the hospital. They were Catholic. The mom said that little girl came home every Sunday singing courses she learned at your church. Would you preach her funeral? Yes, ma'am. That man wouldn't even shake my hand. When the, the mortician introduced me to him, I'd never met him before. He's, and I stuck my hand out to shake his hand, and he cursed me. And lifted his fist to God and cursed God. What kind of a God is it that would take my little girl? Six months later was sitting in my office. Said, I've never had a priest talk to me before. <laughs> Very good. I could have said you still don't. But that's all right. And then I listened to him. He said, I'm, I'm worse than an animal. I'm not a man, a human, there's something wrong with me. And when he got through telling me about his tale of woe, I said, Bill, Jesus loves you. He was speechless. He looked at me and, as if to say, he finally did. He said, why? I said, I can't explain it. But I can just assure you that Jesus loves you. And I began to tell him, a witness to him, and give him the gospel in a nutshell. And when I got down to the place of leading him in prayer, I said, I want to pray with you. Would you like to pray and ask Jesus to become your Savior and Lord, to forgive your sins? Yes, sir. And I said, well, I'll just pray with you. He said, well, I don't know how to pray. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You just follow me and I'm going to help you. I got up out of my seat and I scooted around the corner of my desk to put my hand on his shoulder and the Holy Spirit spoke these words to me. I just wanted to show you there is no person I cannot touch, I cannot save. I am God, I can save to the uttermost, from the guttermost. I am a Savior and Lord. I led him in the sinner's prayer. And when I got down to the place he was confessing he was a sinner, I, I liked to fool with people a little bit. I said, oh, and I, here's how I led him. I am a dirty, rotten, no good, low down sinner. He prayed that prayer with me. Lord, would you forgive me? Do you know what happened? God put his arms around Bill that day. And saved his soul. Changed his life. God cares about you. He cares about me. He cares about our kids. 
He's more concerned about your unsaved children than you are. I don't care how concerned you are. He's more concerned. God so loved the world. But when that joy comes, when a person knows Christ, there's also the joy of the person who does the finding. It's the greatest joy. It's indescribable to be able to lead people to the Lord. It's a great privilege that God has given to us. And then others join with us in rejoicing. That's number three. Threefold, fourfold. The church family rejoices over those who come to faith in Jesus. Every day, I, can, I was talking to some of the folks after the funeral yesterday, and we got to talking about children and when you know it, I have great grandchildren, two of them now. And I've got one I've never seen except pictures. But I get a picture every day. And that little rascal must be eating. I don't know what kind of beans you eat to get start growing like that kid is already growing. And there she sits. And I'm thinking, thank God, what a miracle. When I visited Tyler and Kathy, a few weeks before, when we were there on vacation, we went by to see them. And they took me in the nursery where they were building and putting together their nursery, getting ready for that little one to come. And the joy that comes at the, the birth of a new child, I'll tell you, that's where the joy is in the church. It's the new believers. And they, they, they will infect you with it. They will begin to bring joy to us old folks who have lost some of our joy and need it restored. And we begin to get excited. That's where God wants us to be. He wants the new, new life coming and rejoicing over the people that are coming to Christ as Savior. All heaven, the Bible says, there's joy in heaven. Did you know that? Did you know God rejoices? As Zephaniah said, he will sing over you and dance over you. God cares about you this morning. And I believe when souls come in, I believe the Lord himself is leading the joyous occasion and celebration in heaven. And the angels are joining in as heaven rejoices. I've always read that passage as if my joy somehow struck them joy. It's the opposite. It's God's joy that we feel when we reach the loss. We experience heaven's joy. Now, this whole message started because I did not intend to go here today as I was thinking about how prone we are, and I do, believe me, don't take me wrong, listen to me very carefully. We talk an awful lot about healing. We pray a lot of prayers in our services for people to be healed. I believe in healing. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But what I am saying is that God was dealing with my heart. What is the main thing? The main thing is souls, is souls. And the Lord was helping me. He was saying to me, this is what I got. Don't quit praying for the sick. Don't quit praying for people to be delivered. But what about the souls, son? What about the lost? Do we really want to come together and just have a shouting good time while the world is going to hell in a handbasket? Or do we catch the vision that God has, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? I hear complaints every once in a while about how we do our platform or whatever. 
but I never get a complaint about empty altars. And I'm saying, what's wrong with this picture? The main thing must be the main thing. And the main thing with the Lord is souls. You can be healed and go to hell. But you can't be saved and go to hell. And God is saying, you just don't quit this one. You're doing fine there. Bring this one up. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest. With thrust forth laborers into his harvest field. It's his harvest. It's not ours. And so I, I deliver this message. And you see what will be typified with the cup and the bread is the sacrifice through which whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that gave us peace was placed upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. I love the casual dress, but I don't want to be casual about my Lord. I want to stay the course. Souls. 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 That's where joy comes from. If we're instrumental... And I'm thinking, a Sunday school teacher in a room with the door closed, and you could be in one of those rooms over there where the windows are all clouded over because the moisture's got between the glass. Nobody seems to know you're there, but you have a great opportunity to show love and concern for a kid that's sitting out there and that kid's life can be changed simply because you were faithful to what you're doing.